Let's tape forever. Here's your weekly dose of relationship fuel with Sammy and Nathan Yeager. Hello and welcome to Date Forever. In this week's episode, we're chatting about the reasons why relationships end and achieving continual growth within your relationship. But before we dive into that, Sammy, what's been fueling you up this week? We had such a fun weekend. Yeah, we did, didn't we? Yeah, we celebrated uh, the lovely Joshua Taylor's 30th birthday. Yeah. (laughs) And I think Josh was one of the first guests to interview us and ask Mm. us some questions on the show way back in season one. He was a guest interviewer, wasn't he? Yep. Yeah, but we we had a really fun night celebrating him turning big 3-0. It's a milestone and uh, did some reflection on the person that he was and the person that I was when we first met and who we are today, which is pretty cool to s- reflect and take a moment to see the growth too. Hmm. What about you, Nath? What fueled you up? Oh, that was definitely one of my highlights, uh, having a little boogie on the dance floor and stuff like that afterwards. Um, but the other thing that fueled me up was getting my first win at footy. I played my 20th game in the first win, so... <laughs> um, Your team's been rocking it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've been rocking it. Um, no, nah, but it was really nice to be able to celebrate with the team and be able to sing the club song for the first time, so that was a real highlight. Yeah, and I overheard Nath, like, calling his parents to tell uh, them about the win, and Nath's dad goes, did you know the lyrics? <laughs> I did. I did. Well, most of them anyway. <laughs> I got us by. But now I'm really excited to introduce this week's guest. Today we're welcoming Amanda Ashton. She has been a relationship therapist for 15 years. Her turn ons, which have become her life's work, include a passionate connection, hot sex, unending romance, and living in love. Her latest venture, The Romance Revolution, is the culmination of 40,000 hours of coaching experience and makes a higher standard of relating accessible to everyone. Welcome to the show, Amanda. Thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. 40,000 hours is a lot of hours. <laughs> it's quite amazing when when I think about it now. Um and it's been a cross section in that it's been. I've worked in a lot of different areas of human behaviour and done a lot of different types of coaching. Um, but it's yeah, it's been a, a wild ride. Now here is the real challenge: mm-hmm. what can you deliver in forty five minutes on a podcast episode? <laughs> <laughs> Out of forty thousand hours of work, yeah. <laughs> I'll try and condense it down. I'll try and get just the. <laughs> Yeah, the best of the best. No, so thank you so much for joining us. How did you end up in the relationship space? So from the coaching and all of the different facets of human behaviour that you've worked in, how did you land in romantic relationships? I think I've always been love obsessed, to be honest. I think since I was a little girl, I remember having a vision very young, like of a couple, of a couple deeply, deeply in love. And it was something that I was always taken by, I was always really kind of dreamy and uh, into that other sort of realm of things. And I don't, I think it took me a long time to listen to that. So I sort of finished school, went into corporate life and woke up, had that existential crisis of like, oh my God, I'm killing it and earning a lot of money and got a great job and all this freedom and I hate it. Mm. So I had to rethink it all. And I went traveling for a couple of years. And um, when I came back, I was like, if I was going to get intentional with my life, I'd meet those people that were wholehearted for want of a better term, Mm -hmm. Brene Brown's term. And I'd feel that pang of jealousy. And it sort of was like, what is it that I want? I want to wake up and I want to be in love with my life. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? So it was kind of a reverse engineer from that. And then sort of discovered through that, that I wanted to teach people how to live passionately like that, but I had to get that for myself first. Mm -hmm. So, you know, got into coaching, went down that path to understand human behaviour a lot better and fell in love with it. And along the path, it's just kept steering me back. I think in the coaching industry, you call in or you get attract clients are attracted to what they're going to get from you. And um, so it started as like general relationships, if you like, and then that expanded into working in with men in about relationships, so doing pretty much solely men's work. 
Um, and then I ran retreats in Bali and did that. And I got into addiction work over there, working in rehabs and all of that. And it all just kind of pieced together. And through that work, I then got into the sexuality stuff. So people were coming to me for relationship stuff and we'd work to, through the things, but what they were really wanting was to be in love and to be passionate with each other and to live there. And so I started to go, I went into sexuality coaching and in the Tantra world and did a lot of work in that space. And then it's all kind of just come together into something that makes sense to me and that people really want. And so I'd hear you hear these themes when you coach people about the undertone of what they're looking for. And I really believe that they want romance Mm -hmm. and not flowers and chocolates on Valentine's Day, but real romance, what that really means, which is that connectivity and the presence and that I'm paying attention. It's that in 8 billion people in the world, you're my person and I'm paying attention and I know you and I see you intimately. And so that became something that I got obsessed with in my own life and also in, um, in, in helping people to have that in their life. And it's just continued to unfold until we got to the romance revolution. Beautiful. So I, I'm really excited about this conversation and I want to take it right back. So if you were meeting a couple who had just sort of started dating, they've got an inkling that, hey, I think this might be my my person. I think this is the person I want to choose and I think they're choosing me. What are the things that you would encourage them to go about learning and mastering to set themselves up for success for forever? That's a great question. And I think there's a few things. Firstly, I think everyone you date, you should treat like they're the one, mm-hmm. regardless if you date them for a week or you date them for a month. I think that's just human decency to treat people well. I think that's become missing out there Mm. in the world where we sort of, I guess, Tinder is that swipe right, swipe left, you know, like you can still date people and get to know them and and treat them really well and be a great part of the story for them. So I think as an ethos, you should be walking through life, treating people exceptionally well. Um, So I think to start there, but then I think if you, for a relationship, if you kind of have that, like, wow, I think you've got to get it amongst the conversation of what do you really want? Because there's really only two reasons why relationships end. One is what we call unfulfilled strategies, which is where you want different things from your life. So, for example, if somebody wants kids and someone doesn't, someone's going to have to compromise at some point and miss out on what their deeper fulfillment is. Mm. Those conversations have to start up front where you get clear. Now, people don't always know what it is that they want, but I think having those conversations is really, really important. I think that the love as a subject is grossly misunderstood. I think a lot of people think it's like this spell that they're under that they're powerless to, like this, I fell in love. Mm. And I I think you rise in love for a start, but I think it's intentional. I think it's a verb. I think it's something that you do. I used to be under that, soulmates and, you know, twin flames and all of those sorts of things, Mm. which I'm still believing in a different way to what I used to. It used to be much more powerless, like you're going to bang up against someone in the street and then you're sort of held under this spell, whereas I think love always is going to pull you forward into your higher self and you have to be prepared for what that means because it's going to call up everything that's not love in Mm. each of the individuals and that's the rocky road where you're navigating and if you you've got to find a way to get unmeshed in that. I love that you've shared that and that's something that from a languaging point of view that I've been very mindful of over the last couple of years it's not not falling in love not um, being consumed by love but like choosing it stepping into love I, I'm choosing to step into love and I I see I've still got some girlfriends who are, are dating and they really they really want life partnership with someone and they spend time and energy with people that they are have, what was the language have strategy like unfulfilled strategy um and mm-hmm. they spend time with people who have said from the outset that they have a different strategy they have a different life plan <laughs> but they're actively choosing to step into that even though it's the wrong thing yeah and i i think this i think it's become uh, I think when it's unconscious what your needs are, what you actually want for your life and and you go out there in the world, it becomes a get-get energy a lot of the time and it becomes this battle of like 
I'm going to get my needs met and I'm going to get my needs met rather than it's got to go the other way where it's give, give. Mm. You're in that slipstream. That's where love thrives. That's where it's beautiful, where it's like, I want you to be full and I want you to be full. And then everybody gets what they want. And it's, it's not that um, take, take energy. And yeah. I think a lot of people get that wrong, especially you know, out there in the in in the dating world, they it's it's looking to, either for someone to rescue them. You know, I hear that a lot too, mm. where people have a list of what they want in a partner and they're not any of it. Mm. I want a rich man. And it's like, how 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 wealthy are you? How established are you? And they're like, oh no, I, I live week to week. And mm. you know, but I it's it's sort of that I want someone to come in and take responsibility for my life. And then the reality is somebody who's there isn't going to be interested in somebody that's there because it's not going to be a match. Yeah. You've got to take responsibility in those things. But, yeah, I think that having those conversations up front is really, really important. And then I think it's about getting conscious around creating your experience. So the other, the, the unfulfilled strategies is one reason why relationships fall down. The other one is what we call negative anchoring, which is where basically we're always anchoring emotion to any situation. And if you're associating a person with negative emotion or with unloving emotion or pain in, in any way, the relationship will die. So you you want to be able to know how to cultivate joy together. This is where romance comes in mm. because you're constantly putting deposits in your sort of emotional bank account of loving experiences, of joy-filled experiences, of connected, passionate experiences. And I think in that is where you strengthen your relationship. But if it's unconscious and you're just kind of walking through life and then there's, you know, issues where you might have disconnection but you don't know how to come back into deeper connection, then you're going to be negative, negatively anchoring each other constantly and you want to pull away from it. Can I, I want to make sure that I fully understood that. So negative anchoring. So that would be like going into your relationship with the opposite of rose colored glasses and looking for all of the negative, unkind, darker feelings in what, or, or intentions in what someone's doing as opposed to the opposite of that. It can be that. That can be one, like if somebody's got unhealed wounding um, where, I don't know, they've got traumas and, and past experiences, so the lenses they look through life through mm-hmm. are faulty, essentially. So they, they find, they're looking through a fear lens and they find everything wrong in everything. Mm-hmm. Then the other person isn't getting loved. They're getting fear energy, lack of trust energy, and they might feel like they've got to prove themselves or that's diabolical. So it is there's a responsibility to work through your own filters to see clearly to look at life through a loving lens mm. if you like but it can also happen in a relationship where like I was saying before where love calls up everything that's not love to become love that's the function of relationship is it's meant to you're meant to evolve together you're meant to grow together and become more loving in your capacity to give love and receive love and when you don't know how to navigate that it's sort of the, you know, people talk about the honeymoon period. I believe yeah. it's a myth. I don't think that's accurate. I think that that's a, you just did things, poured love into the space and got a different result, you know? I I love that you've said that because Nathan and I have been together for, I don't oh, know, 15, since 2007, years or something. Yeah. but married for 10 and a bit. We got married in 2012. And we get those kind of comments occasionally about like, oh, you you like very much still like honeymoon. You seem so like in love with each other. I'm like, yeah, because we choose that. We're intentional and, about intentional it. Intentional about it. Yeah. But yeah, I think there was a lot of cynicism, especially like because we got married quite young at 23, 24 years old. And I think there was a lot of cynicism that it was like, oh, you're still in the honeymoon period. Like that won't last. Wait till that ends. And like mm. we'd already been together for five years at that point. Like. Um, but I love that you've called that out and said honeymoon period doesn't have to end. I love hearing that you two have continued your love story because it is really an active program, you know. It's it's something that when you actively participate in cultivating love together, it stays there. Mm. Not magic. You know, people mm. think it is, but these false beliefs around honeymoon periods or it's just going to go that way. The amount of times I've heard that as well where it's like, well, this is just marriage. Mm. Really? Is it? And I've, I've heard this as well that, like, if you did what you were doing in year one or year two of your relationship, 
like there was something that was working there to keep that spark alive and that fire alive. So like there's there's lessons from our past that we can be bringing to our present as well. That, oh, uh, you you think about like I love the name of your podcast, The Date Forever. I just think it's amazing because it's it is that. And why would you stop? The only reason you stop is that you don't know how to navigate the stormier waters and you never come back to deeper connection when there's a disconnection. So mm-hmm. I, you know, people's fears come up and all of those sorts of stuff and they don't navigate it to deeper intimacy. If you keep navigating to deeper intimacy, keep exploring and growing together, it's an alive, thriving love affair Mm. or it's dead. I mean, the couples I'm most scared of are the ones that come in and say, we never fight. Mm. I'm like, oh, here we go. (laughs) (laughs) The couples that come in and are like at each other kind of, there's a tension. It's like, oh, you've got an alive Mm really are invested in it you care about each other and you just don't know how to come back to each other I think that's so important because I think like early days Nathan and I didn't really fight very much and oh the first year there was oh, I the think first a bit year of, we fought a lot a bit of wrestling yeah <laughs> a lot a lot but then we entered a like peace era <laughs> um and as I reflect back on that I'm like that was the absence of conversations that was the absence of one or both of us advocating for what it was that we truly wanted or needed. And I think, like I, I reflect on it, I'm like, I think that was, I figured out I really love this person and I do not want them to leave. I, I like, I, I'm so invested in this that I can't rock the boat. Um, and I think that has been such a pivotal thing for Nathan and I to learn is like how to do conflict well with kindness with respect for self, with respect for other, respect for our relationship. Mm. But not only the conflict part, but then able to repair afterwards and not have that conflict consume more than the space it needed. Yeah, so I, I really love that you've shared that. Um, I think that's such a pivotal skill that we we never, we didn't know that. We didn't know we needed to go and learn that. We didn't know we needed to go to a conflict workshop and a repair, like figure those skills out. Like that was hard learned. Um, for sure. But yeah, I think the absence of conflict is a is a massive warning sign. Something's not right here. You're either not bringing your whole self to the table. There's going to be conflict. Conflict doesn't have to be bad. This is the mm-hmm. thing. Like I was actually teaching, I have a program called Rupture and Repair, which is all about when disconnection happens, how do you come back into deeper connection with each other? And I was teaching the other night and we were taught somebody was really triggered by the word conflict because it's what they their shaping had been was conflict is bad and nasty and you know, difference is good. Difference holds possibility. I love when there's difference of opinion. I hate when there's disrespect. Mm-hmm. I hate when yeah. there's nastiness or there's like we have to win. That's egoic kind of stuff but when somebody has a different different opinion that I haven't thought about or looked at I quite like that I'm like oh tell me more like mm. and why I'm do e- you think that why do you believe that Where yeah that and I'm from? either gonna expand my awareness or go yeah no I don't believe that like mm. but it doesn't have to be power over or take power away from someone like that's I think that's often what's wrong with the world is we don't allow difference we think difference is a threat mm rather than expansive that's how you grow Mm, and in couples the same it's like you should celebrate that you're meant to have differences so each other can expand Mm. and I think so much in relationships like there's differences in the beginning of a relationship like there's two individuals that have come together and I think like in our case as well we were trying to jostle and trying to work out how that all sort of fits together but it's those differences that attracted you to that person in the first place and so, like, as a relationship goes along, if if you become aligned on everything, like, oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, absolutely. And that's where it loses. Yeah. This is interesting because this is where you get into sexual attraction as well. Like a lot of people, there's a lot of polarity teaching out there of masculine and feminine, which is not something I subscribe to um, because I think that we're all all things. But mm. the, the the attraction that we have is there's parts of you and there's parts of the other person that you're meant to rub up against and Mm. because you admire those qualities, you want them, you want to be able to expand into them. But when we get competitive in a a coupledom or in a relationship, then that's where the, the, you know, the trouble really starts because Mm. if you can open and go, wow, you do that epically and I'm not so great at that, I could really learn something from Mm. you, vice versa, you'll get that harmonious 
beauty of of having reverence for each other's strengths, really, rather than who's better or who's doing life better. It's just not about any of that. Yeah, I think it's Gottman who talk about that, um, the ratio of interactions that you need. I think it's for every one negative one, there needs to be seven good ones to sort of even it out. But you're not shooting for seven to zero. You need that one negative interaction to create friction so that there's growth. If there's not friction, then there's not those opportunities to improve your your relationship or move forward or or for it to evolve. I think people are really scared of that one interaction and that that can be very consuming as well. I think too, people are generally really frightened of emotion. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I, I kind of even sort of reject the notion of positive and negative emotions. There's just emotions. And when you know how to navigate them and understand them and what they're there for and, mm. you know, what the, the messages are underneath, I think that literacy is really, really important because then you cannot, like traditionally we're uncomfortable with with strong emotions like anger and sad. You think about mm. when someone cries, most people are like, they're there, cheer up. Yeah, please stop crying because you're making me uncomfortable. Exactly. Rather than actually going, fantastic, cry your eyes out. I'm here, right here. I got you. You know, like instead of doing that approach is just relatively new when when you think about it. It's Mm. probably in the last 10 years that we're starting to wake up to emotions and the connectedness of them and, you know, what they're all there for. And I so I think when you learn about that stuff and you aren't afraid of the strong emotion you can navigate that as a couple really well because it's it's distressing when you see people you love in pain but it's very very necessary for their growth and that's often where we block each other's growth because we're happiness bullies Mm. I need you to be happy all the time and that Mm. means that I made you happy in my relationship and it's Mm. like asking for there to only be sunshine all the time like you have to have the seasons and you have to have your own growth journey but where a relationship gets really solid is where that's all encompassed in it and it's not fragile it's like anti-fragile so and I think you only have that like you two with the first year where you said it was quite um (laughs) But the solidness is where it's like I've shown you all the shadow sides of me and you're still here, you must love me, now we can relax. Yeah. Mm. But we do unconsciously test each other in that. Yeah, and I think for us like it was learning that a healthy relationship, you, you really should have the ability to say yes and no. It doesn't have to always be yes. And I I think sometimes that's really scary to say no to your partner or to even to yourself. Um, or to sometimes say say yes to things that you want to say no to. I think there there needs to be that harmony. But if you if you only ever say yes to your partner, I think that's really dangerous territory to be in. Massively, and that also where that's where resentment gets gets bred. I've mm. seen that so much where, and it comes from a good intention. Like particularly men, I see a lot of this where they want to be a good partner, mm. but they don't take care of their end of the street, so they self abandon. And then they turn their partner into their mother Hmm. and they're angry. (laughs) They're angry because I did all, I ticked all the boxes and I did all the right things, but I didn't take care of how I felt. I didn't say no when I meant, I said no, I said yes when I meant no. Yeah. I have two friends who did a lot of self-sacrificing in their relationships. One's a, a male mate and that relationship ended up ending. And I have a girlfriend and she was doing that in her relationship and they took some time apart and redesigned it. But yeah, that self-sacrificing where the other person wasn't even aware that they were making compromises, sacrifices, like, you know, even to the point of like, well, I won't use that mug in the house because... I want my partner to be able to use the good one. Like what? Like that Like that level of like I, I'm just going to do absolutely everything, self-sacrifice, say yes to everything, take the holiday that they want to take, spend time with the family that they want to spend time with, go to the parties that they want to go to, watch what they want to watch on Netflix, all of that to the point where it's like you've just eroded every sense of self in in that relationship and in that relationship with yourself. And then blamed the other person. Yeah. And yeah. that's and then they don't they they feel like you know I'm so unseen or mm. I'm like you know I've done so much and it's like nobody asked you to like you yeah. you have to take responsibility for showing up for as you and 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 I think a lot of people too 
bypass doing the actual work. Like that's where it is. It's not a um, evolved relationship. It's sort of a often just a rinse and repeat of what you've been brought up in. I'll just show up. I'll just do the thing Mm. and not actively participating in that. They're not actively participating in their own growth and their own life. They're holding it together to create not an illusion. Probably it is an illusion, but like this is a box I tick. Mm. Now I have a relationship. Now I get married. Now, you know, we have kids. Mm. Now we buy a house or whatever that looks like. But there's no consciousness around it. Yeah. And the thing that I observed in both of those friends was um, how little they were re- lacking a relationship with themselves, that they didn't actually have a lot of awareness around what it was that they wanted, what it was that they needed, what their boundaries were. Um, both of those hu- wonderful humans, still friends, um, have done a lot of work around that thing, but it was such a beautiful thing to watch them go through that. But, I don't, yeah, I think that comes back to the relationship that I have with myself sets the tone for every other relationship that I have. Yeah, absolutely. It is, it is. And you're only going to ever show up for somebody else to the degree that you show up for yourself. Mm. If you're not loving you, then you, you're you not going to be able to actively love another human. We call that, we call attachment love a lot of the time. Mm. But it's it's not, um, yeah, I, I don't, I, I'm very specific about what love actually is and I think that it's not, it's not attached and that can be really challenging because we can still want something and we can still want to be in each other's lives but quite often we cut off other people's freedom mm. and their choice because I need you to be this for me and that feels restrictive. That doesn't feel thriving. It doesn't feel, it, and it also dies. I think like, you know, like you two were saying, you're actively growing all mm. the time. There has to be a level of non-attachment to that. Like the relationship itself is just the space between two people. And it's what you put into it. And if you're actively both trying to pour love in and do that where you're wanting the best for each other's souls, then you can't cut off parts of somebody's personality to make mm. that fit without mm. there being a price to pay, which will yeah. be connection, you know, real connection, real intimacy is just shared truth. And if you're not staying in that truth with yourself and each other, it, it dies. It's, it's quite yeah. simple in that way, but scary and much harder road to do. It's a it's a it's a much steeper gradient if you're going to stay in truth with each other because we've all got these messy parts and these dark sides and these parts that are scary to face for ourselves, let alone with the person we love. Mm. And the parts that you push on and it really hurts. Yeah, yeah, mm. absolutely, absolutely. But when you when you know how to navigate that and you know how to heal as well. Like I think one of the, for me, you know, I've had an incredibly romantic life, but both sides of the coin, there's been a lot of extraordinary light and extraordinary darkness. Mm -hmm. And I think that courage and bravery of knowing how to heal from going through a lot of stuff makes you show up even more loving. It's like, you know, like this will hurt, but I'm still going to lean in with love as opposed to I'm going to live in fear. You know, I often say to people there's two kinds of people that there's those that live making all their decisions to avoid the pit, what I call the pit, which is where you face yourself. So they're not even facing themselves. They're just working egoically out there in the world. They're not looking at any stuff. And then there's those that face the pit, fall in the pit, rumble around in it. It's messy. They go, God, I never want to feel that way again. They find their way out of the pit. And then they fall back in the pit again. Mm, <laughs> and new that, level, new devil. I, I love that. I love that. Mm. And then over and over and over. And then eventually the pit's not scary. Like I, my first time in the pit was like two years and you would call that depression. You would call that, you know, loss of whatever spark or life force mm. or whatever you want to call it. Now it's like an afternoon. Mm-hmm. Because I've got the tools to do it and I know like, oh, okay, I've got to feel my feelings. I've got to go and have a cry. I've got to go and rage. I've got to go and let the energy move, process it, and it's not scary anymore. But mm. it takes work to get there. It takes, you know, it's not for the faint heart and I say to people. like, Yeah, it's- yeah my first time in the pit was, yeah, it was an interesting one. So, like, it was very much around our relationship and me really not taking life by the horns really. So I was, I was just kind of cruising through life, not really advocating for myself and what I wanted. And that was definitely affecting our relationship too because 
there was opportunities out there like that I just wasn't taking. I wasn't really leading our romantic relationship or anything in life. And yeah, that, that was a real struggle. And it kind of came to a head over a, a long weekend where I said I would organize some plans and I just didn't do it. And it was it was really challenging. Like it was hard to kind of realize that I'd been stagnant and stuck. And, and it definitely took a while to wade through that. And I had to get uh, some external help to kind of get through that as well. I, I, I honestly, I think everyone that goes through it needs external help. I think that, yeah. I think, I think that's, first of all, I really commend you on doing that because it's mm. not easy. It's re- face, most people don't. I'd say 90% of people don't face themselves, not mm, really yeah. get in there and go, I did that shit thing. Like, mm. you know, I really hurt that person and take responsibility and look at why that reaction happened. Most people don't do it. So anyone yeah. that does, mm gets my vote because that's it's brave it's scary it mm. you know becoming healing trauma cycles and doing life differently and taking responsibility for that is something you should be super freaking proud of mm. it's most people just don't and then they stay stuck and then they can continue to cause the pain that they've inherited essentially so what, yeah. what's that quote is like um people end up in therapy trying to deal with the people who refuse oh. to go to therapy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's yeah. exactly right. I call it hostage taking. Mm. You know, people that don't deal with their pain, spread it all over everybody. Then they say stuck in that sort of self-indulgent loop of, oh, it just never works out for me. And and then, you know, they can feel it too. They're like, you know, my bad luck or whatever that is, but they don't ever really take responsibility. You can always mm. see the ability takers so you know the people that are out there doing the work you know like it's it's they're uh, always the people that say oh it must be nice insert whatever it must be nice to have a supportive husband it It must must be nice to have a career that you know is rewarding and fulfilling oh it must be nice to like as if it just sort of happened and like yeah those people who are lucky Lucky oh yeah so lucky you're so lucky like Yeah. yeah Yeah, and that, and I mean that that powerlessness. I mean, the reality is, we get pain to make us grow. Pain is a call to action. Mm. It's it's the thing that makes us. You know, you think about when you're sick, something happens in your body that alerts you that something needs attention. Mm. Same with our soul. We get pain because we didn't get the outcome we wanted, and we need to go in and heal and look at that and and you know change the way we do things. And so. It's when you're paying attention to that, that's alignment. You know, that's pulling you into alignment. So this is one of the skill sets that I think is really important for couples too is to get okay with people having their pain, not to try and rescue them or stop it because the Mm. less keep coming. So that from a partnership perspective, it's kind of really that detachment to a degree where you're like, I get that you're a soul that's on your own journey that's got your own pain to work through. All I can do is be here with you and say I'm here. I don't need to fix it. I don't need to lean in. I can offer support if you want advice or if you want to lean, like we can we can talk about those things, but it's really your journey to overcome, to look at through the different lens and there's gold underneath that stuff if you're mm. willing to face it. Like look at you two. If you hadn't had that, Nate. Oh, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know how long I had left in me with <laughs> Nate standing still and that's like really confronting because yeah. um, that had come to a head because I had been in the pit for like I reckon two years at that point and I'd like I'd had a like if you'd mapped it on a graph the trajectory of growth was like a straight line up over a very quite short period of time I reckon I had like a decade's worth of growth in about three years I was working with a coach I was working in an environment very um, centered around personal and professional development and I was like being exposed to new ideas new concepts new frameworks like daily so I, I went through a very rapid um, growth trajectory in quite a few different areas of my life. And then I was looking back at my partner who I loved deeply and had never considered that we wouldn't make it, never, and thought, fuck, if he doesn't grow, what's going to happen? Because I could feel mm. the gap getting bigger. And not not to say that I was better than Nathan in any way. It was just that I, I was evolving. I was hitting new levels and I was really, really scared about what would happen if he didn't come with me. Yeah, that's a really valid thing and I think it happens a lot in couples. I would see mm. that 
in a lot of different areas that I've worked where people would expand and terrified that their partner wasn't going to come along for that ride, you know, because it's it, it's a very limited path. You're not going to be able to share life together to the depth that you can, like what's available, like mm-hmm. what you guys have, what you've navigated. But at the same time, it's brilliant that your soul was strong enough to kind of have that mm-hmm. No, I'm not stepping back. You have to step up. Yeah. Uh, I think that was part of what was really scary. It was like, I really love who I'm becoming. I really love the person that I'm evolving into. I love the skills that I'm developing. I love the tools that I'm adding to this toolbox. And I'm not willing to stay here so that I don't outgrow my partner. Um, So it was, yeah, the commitment to like, okay, well, I need to be able to communicate the get on board or not or else but or else like yeah. It, it yeah and it really did come to a head and I like at the it's this is probably one of those post-traumatic growth kind of things where we had a really like horrible in the moment uh conflict and then we look back on that now and are so grateful that it happened when it happened yeah. and not if it had happened 12 months later I probably wouldn't have had as much tolerance to hold space for Nath to sort of start the journey because you know it was almost like I've had this going on for two or three years now I don't know that if it if that if we'd come to a head a year later it would have been one year further ahead in growth and that you know and recognizing that all plants don't grow at the same rate right and Mm -hmm. they don't they don't grow under the same conditions Um, but I'm very very grateful for that experience now as awful as it was in the moment (laughs) Yeah, exactly. This is the thing. Yeah. Like, it, it, this is where you, I think, you start to find a real peace where you're not here to evade the hard stuff. The skill set, I believe, is learning to cultivate the emotions you want to feel and learning to navigate the ones that you want to avoid. When you mm-hmm. get that down and you're not afraid of navigating the hard stuff, but you know how to cultivate the stuff you want to feel, you get yeah. free. Mm-hmm. Like you're no longer dress rehearsing tragedy. You're no longer doing any of that stuff. But the other thing I wanted to point out there that I think is amazing is when you chose you and you stepped into your own growth, which was actively loving you, it's pulled you into another level of awareness and all of that. But what you didn't do was play small with Nate. Mm. So you're actually believing in his bigness. That's love. Yeah. I invite you to come with me. I know I you invite can. you. I, you yeah, I invite you to step into you the have arena. To step into your love mm. in you and with me, else it's a no deal. And then yeah. it's not an ultimatum. It is, I am not going to believe in your smallness because you're afraid of your bigness. Yeah. And I, I, as I reflect on that, I guess that is an unfulfilled strategy, wasn't it? It was that my my vision for my my life and our relationship was getting bigger. And I don't think Nath's was. It was like that could have very easily become an unfulfilled strategy if he hadn't. Oh, I've had relationships end like that where, mm. you know, I, I work and live in this space of mm. growth and human behaviour and I've had, in fact, mostly I've dated people that aren't in this space. But I've had relationships die because people don't want to grow. Literally mm. it's just been like I'm, I'm comfortable here. Mm. Now, I know the path of where that leads to and, the, you know, you never, the thing with pain, you get the pain of growth or the pain of regret. You're never mm-hmm. outrunning pain. The more, the quicker you reconcile that and go, yeah. there's going to be an element of pain in everything, I'm either going to look back on my life and regret all this stuff I didn't do into my own growth and, you know, owning my desires and fulfilment and stuff like that, or it's going to be painful to grow and move through my ego and some of those sorts of things. You don't get to outrun it. That's that's yeah. the choose your hard, right? Choose the hard of totally. leaning into growth and doing the hard thing or choose the hard that your person or your partner might not be there anymore. Totally. And choose and you, your hard. Absolutely. When I first started out coaching, when I was a student coach actually, I worked um, in death. I worked with people dying. Mm. It was mainly older people. Um, And it was fascinating to me because you could see distinctly those that had lived flat out from their heart Mm. 
and their bodies were just breaking down, but they were like, that was a hell of a ride. Mm. And then you saw the bitter and twisted, regret-filled, resistant, like I like they'd wasted the journey and mm. you, they knew it and their deaths were painful and their everything about it was painful, their relationships around them, family, unreconciled, so much was untalked about, you know, all of that that I think was really game changing for me because I was like, I want to be like those people that are like mm. rode know. the roller coaster to the end. Yeah. And uh, yeah, totally. I loved it. I loved it. And still having a ripping time, even though, you know, they're dying and they're sick and they're full of people that love them around them. And it was just so contrasting that it was quite the gift to experience in terms of, wow, you never outrun this stuff. Like, mm. I think my I think my great grandmother was the latter of that. So Nathan and I went to go visit her and we knew that she didn't have very long left to live. And she was so over it. She was like, I'm just ready to go. And she had some friends come and visit. And um the friends were about to go on a holiday for I think like two weeks or something. And they were they were saying goodbye and they're like, We'll see you when we get back. And she was like, Oh gosh, I hope not. Like she just didn't, she knew she didn't want to be around for another two weeks. Like I'm so done. And I thought like, that's really, really beautiful. And she, you know, her husband had died 20 years earlier. So she'd had this whole other life and she'd traveled the world and, you know, was still getting on planes. And she's the kind of old lady who was standing up on the bus for the old ladies. Like she didn't quite. That young spirit, you see it, like the aliveness, it was it, yeah, it was it was really it's quite incredible when you see that you can live close to your spirit if you if you live close to your heart, if you listen to that part, if you if you're connected to that and stay connected to that throughout your life. I think that you, you're writing your own adventure the whole time and they're you know they're they're not afraid. They're not afraid mm. of death, they're not afraid. There's no like they're not no regrets. I'm sure everybody's got regrets or wishes they'd done certain things differently, but there's a fullness, if you like. That is just yeah. so beautiful to be around. And that you see that in people. We see it, you know, you see it in elderly people that are still cracking jokes and having a great time. And yeah. I love that. It's one of the things that brings me great joy. Mm. So Amanda, to bring this back and sort of round it out, um, we talked about like the two reasons that relationships end being unfulfilled strategy and negative anchoring. And we talked about some of the foundational skills that couples should really go about building in in conflict and communication and commitment to their own growth. But I'm really curious, like what are some of the maybe less common um, practices that you would encourage couples to embed into their relationship, whether or not it's daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually, to keep their relationship really fueled up? I think. Two things, presence and romance. So presence, I mean, really dropping into it. It's so easy to get busy. And um, I used to work in in a with a tantra group and, and teaching tantra workshops and things like that. And I'll never forget a couple that came in once who were gorgeous, you know, four kids, been together for like 20 years. Mm. And we did this thing called a transfiguration, which is basically an eye gazing situation where you drop into deep presence and you see the divine in it. You intentionally look for the good in someone. And it's like a two minute exercise. You sit across, look each other in the eyes and it's like, oh, there's my person, you know. Mm. And after the exercise, there was floods of tears and they said, we have not looked at each other for 10 years. Mm. We're here. We come home every day. We kiss hello, but it's a kiss on the cheek. It's a... How I, it, da, 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 moving place to place, kids, food, meals, doing all the stuff, but no presence, no actual I am here and I see you. I think presence is such a powerful thing and I always set my couples onto that when, there's, when they're in trouble or in disconnect is to inject some presence straight away to stop and say hello and goodbye, mm-hmm. have a good day. How was your day? Simple little things like that that is like I'm here and I see you. And then, of course, presence in all areas. I mean, great lovemaking, that's what it is. Orgasm. Mm. Orgasm is the highest form of presence. Mm. That's what it is. That's that's what we're nowhere else in that moment. Mm. We're completely where we are. So presence, I think, is a a huge one. And then romance. I mean, all romance is is a celebration of the union. Mm. It's taking the time to celebrate this person, to celebrate gratitude. It's going 
oh my God, we're going to have, I'm going to surprise and delight this person mm. or we're going to have an injection of fun. I mean, relationships are supposed to be fun. Mm. I'm a big 80, 20 person, 80% of the time, it should be great. Mm. 20% of the time, you should navigate the challenges. And if you're not actively romancing one another, I kind of feel like, what are you doing? Mm. What are you doing? And I think sometimes we get a little bit stuck in like the romancing looking like the Disney movie or looking like the rom-com and that it needs to be these grand, big, huge, expensive, thought out, elaborate gestures. And that's like not it at all. Like it can, it can be grabbing a post-it note and leaving a cute little love note. It can be surprising them at the door naked when they get home it could <laughs> it, it could be an extra passionate kiss or I'll give it one that happened for us the other day was that Nathan and I hit a financial milestone in our savings account something that we've been working towards for a little while and when Nathan walked in the door I gave him that many kisses all over his body because <laughs> I was thinking I was like what are, what am I going to do when Nathan gets home that just like marks this milestone because it had ticked over during the day and I just happened to notice it. Um, and I was like, how can I make this a moment? Like, And I think that's that's the question that we can ask ourselves. How can I make this a moment? That's it exactly. And I and I think that when we do that, it's, it's stitches in the life tapestry and you remember them. Like I can remember every single partner in my life that has done brought beauty to my life like that. And it's those moments. And some of them are big and some of them are little and deeply, deeply personal. I had a woman, husband and wife, who came to see me years ago now and they had a heap of money. They were really, really wealthy. And one Valentine's Day he purchased 60 bunches of flowers or something to be delivered for her and she was in tears with me saying, that's lovely and I feel mm. so bad because all I want is for him to know what my favourite flower is. Mm. He sent the wrong ones. It just, it wasn't, well, she said, I don't feel like I can't even say, like it feels but, really yeah. ungrateful because he's done this big grand gesture. But what that was telling me is that she wanted intimacy. Mm. She doesn't need the big grand gesture. She mm. wants the the more mm. tiny detail, you know. Yeah. And that's- if he'd brought home one of the exact flower yeah. and held yeah. her hand and looked in her eye and said, I, I love you. I yeah. so yeah. much and I love that you love this flower. I think that out there there's a lot of looking evolved rather than being evolved. And the mm. same thing happens where it's performative romance. It's the guy that opens the car door while his friend's there, so he mm. looks like Casanova, but when no one's there, there's no door opening. Mm-hmm. You know? Or it's the girl that is, like, Instagramming all this stuff but doesn't live it behind the mm. scene. Like it's yeah. a, that authentic piece is such an important part, I think, is that it's not performative, it's intimate. Mm. And it's, it's a language that lovers speak between them that sometimes it's only you two that know the relevance of it or the inside joke of it or the time. Gosh, we've got lots of those, don't we? <laughs> and that's yeah, we why do. your relationship is dense with that. That's why yeah. the connection is so strong because, you know, it's like, oh, God, Nath gets how important that is to me or mm. it's it's all those tiny, tiny details. And when you drive your mind to that, it's beautiful to live that way too. So like you were saying before, you spent the afternoon thinking about how Mm. can I create magic? Mm. Or what most people do is find fault in their partner for what they're not doing for them. They're not looking at generating experience, generating emotion, having fun. And part of the creation of that is what's so exciting. Like you would have been looking forward to seeing that. Like you get that excitement Mm. of like, oh, come on, hurry up and come home. I've got this cool thing I'm going to do. You know, it feels just as good giving it as it does receiving it. But it's just a beautiful way to live. And I think that that's that's what is needed in relationship is this active fun and play and Mm. joy and connection and passion. Yeah, I think that's one of the best pieces of advice that I've been given. I don't even know where it came from. It's about like if you want more of something in your relationship, like bring it. If you want more fun, if you want more spontaneity, if you want more romance, if you want more sex, like you can lead that. You don't have to wait for your partner to create that for you. Like, um, And often people will match your energy. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you've got to, I mean, look, there is overgiving. Yeah. That, 
you know that you're not matched there and that's that's something that you've got to be careful of because it can be really hurtful if you're pouring love in and someone's not receiving it or mm. it's mm. it's taken for granted or it's you know it's not appreciated you've got to make sure that match is there together that it's a it's a reciprocal thing because mm. I think a lot of people have done that they've poured their maybe heart. I've been lucky that uh, Nate's responsive <laughs> yeah, well I don't know if it's lucky maybe yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> you know but I, I do think it's something to be really aware of because I think a lot of people are hurt from overgiving, from giving their love in places where it wasn't received well or, you know, things like that. But absolutely it's, you know, romance is so, so important. And it would be the number one thing that I would hear in my rooms about what's missing. I want mm. romance. I would hear it all time, both sides, men yeah. too. It's like it's not just women that are that are wanting romance. There's a lot of men that I just want to feel seen and appreciated and celebrated. And mm-hmm. you know, we should be championing each other. We yeah. should be we should, like I hear it all the time. Always, my best friend is like, "Really? Are you even friends? Mm-hmm. What do you complain about them behind their back? And do you bitch about them to your friends? And you know, do you not tell them how you're feeling? Like this is where it starts to become something that you've got to really actively create." Mm. Amanda this has been so wonderful and we could talk for many more hours probably 40,000 of them (laughs) but um, to say thank you for joining us and we provided two days of access to vocational training to women in Guatemala Um, this project is really about achieving gender equality and empowering all girls and women uh, because we know that when women rise they bring their families and their communities and their countries with them so thank you so much for making that possible and that project is looked after by one foundation and we've made that possible via our partnership with buy one give one so thank you so much i love that thank you for having me no worries so amanda if people want to connect with you or learn a little bit more about what you do how can they do that probably the best way is to join um the romance revolution facebook group on there i post a lot about well free content about relationships on all levels and beautiful things about romance but also programs and different things that we have running there's a suite of programs that I have around sexuality around understanding relationship around rupture and repair Mm. and finding the beauty in things so there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on Um, so probably if they jump on there which is yeah the romance revolution private Facebook group it's a free group and then they'll have access to me and a bunch of other things as well amazing Amanda thank you so much and I just want to check do you see clients globally I do. Yeah, yeah, I do. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much for joining us and I look forward to having you back on the show because I, I feel I definitely feel like we can do this again. <laughs> it was the tip of the iceberg. I felt the same. There wasn't, there's not enough time, but we will we'll definitely come back. It's been absolutely gorgeous to chat with you both. Yeah, amazing. Thanks so much. Thanks heaps for joining us. If you love what we're doing here and want more, subscribe to the Date Forever podcast to make sure you never miss an app. Come and hang out with us and other awesome couples who are fueling up their relationships in the Thriving Couples Collective Facebook group or check us out at purecollective.com.au. Until next time, keep on dating because better relationships equal a better world.